Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard to serve the Lord enthusiastically. My God is awesome. My God is awesome. He can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. My God is awesome. Use me when I'm broken. Strength where I've been weakened. Forever. Come on, let's sing that again. My God is awesome. My God is Awesome. 
it's awesome to uh, be able to be here this morning and uh, rock on some drums and just be in the house of God and just enjoying serving Him. Amen. Amen. To just be in a setting like this, and that's feedback. I'm just going to stay here. Um, to be in a setting like this together as a body of Christ, to serve one another, but to also to just love and worship and honor our Lord. I, uh, I want to share with you this morning a message that we kind of been sharing in our youth ministry for the last couple of weeks called Build. Uh, it's about an awesome man named Nehemiah uh, who just had a heart uh, for his city. That when he saw the need, he moved towards the need of seeing that the walls of Jerusalem were crumbled, that the city was in chaos, and his heart broke and he saw the need. And he prayed to God, Lord, use me. And he went to this need, and, uh, and he used many, many people. He used many different groups and ethnic, ethnic groups. And he used different types of people with their labor for one cause. And that cause was to build the city up again. I want to share and show you a, a picture uh, that many of you might be familiar with. If you're not, we'll just uh, go ahead and look at it. Uh, you can go ahead and show this picture right here on the screen. You guys can check it out. Here it is. Anybody familiar with this photograph? All right. This photograph was, uh, was taken in 1932. Uh, it was, of course, of these 11 men doing something crazy, something I would never do. I would never take a lunch break on this uh, beam right here. Um, and I dare any of our youth to photobomb that photo. Um, but I just look at that as they are eating lunch on this construction support beam. Can anybody, history buffs, can anybody tell me what building this is that they were getting ready to build? Rockefeller Center. All right, all right. That was where it was, Rockefeller Center. Uh, that we all know it there, uh, that celebrates the big Christmas time, lighting of the tree. Um, but I look at this photo and I see these guys taking a complete chance that I would never, ever try to do. If you guys can show the next picture and see the finished product that these gentlemen helped build. Uh, that's beautiful, that tall, tall building. But I look at this, these 11 men in the photograph undoubtedly worked hard to construct this building, and in fact, they put their lives in danger, and not one of these men ever got credit for building that building. Only one man got credit for this building, and that is Mr. Rockefeller. If you look at it, these guys are in these photos, their name's never going to be on a plaque. You walk into the building foyer, you're not going to see this picture or their names written down on a plaque or anywhere. You're going to see one man and one man only. And these guys work so hard, move so diligently to get the job done, and yet they will not get one single credit for it. I look at this and sure they wouldn't have a job without Mr. Rockefeller, but Mr. Rockefeller would not have a building in his name without him. I look at the book of Nehemiah that we're going to get ready to get into and study, is that this book of Nehemiah is very much similar to this, and that we can gather so much information from this story and this view of what the church, what we can do right now, even in the midst of transition that we are getting ready to, to move upon. And I see that when we look at this story that you see it makes sense. You know, Nehemiah got all the credit for making and building these walls of Jerusalem, but it took a group of people. It took individuals to work together and accomplish this mission. And you see in Nehemiah's story, the church that we view and that we see is supposed to work and look like this. It is intended to be a group of people who come together and accomplish good things. Amen? Amen. It is supposed to be a group that offers help to people who are in need, relationships for people who need friends, and jobs for people who need a role. That's the church. It's a group of individuals serving as one. In today's message, I just want to share with you guys a, a key phrase that I want you to remember. Um, you're going to just repeat it after me, after I say it. Through serving, you become who you're meant to be. Say it one more time like you mean it and you're glad to be here. Through serving, 
You become who you're meant to be. Awesome. Now here's the tension that I see, and we're going to hit just a few things this morning, then I'll be, I'll be kind of wrapping up here soon. But the tension that we see, and the problem is, is that when you see that the church is supposed to combine and gather as one, serving together for one purpose, for the kingdom of God to move forward, you look at today's generation, and today's times, and so many times we don't see church and view church like this anymore. Because a lot of times we see church more have relational drama than a cheerleading squad. That we see people are divisive. They keep splitting apart from each other. They have a rough time getting along. And I'm going to just take a time real quick to move from my notes. Because, you know, I'm, I, I like to move away from my notes and just be honest with you guys this morning. That this is something we really need to really focus on when we come in a setting of honor, holiness of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not just a building that we're walking into. This is not just a nice looking stage or, or music that we have ability to listen to. This is the holy temple of our Lord Jesus Christ. That he rests and he reigns and he lives here and blesses his children. When I look at this and see tension that can come within a church, division sometimes that takes place when people have issues with different things, I'm reminded of our Lord Jesus Christ in the prayer in Matthew 6 where it says, Lord, forgive us as we have forgiven those who have hurt us. Or when we see the fact that in a church setting when Jesus says, come and offer your sacrifice to me, that if we have an issue with a brother or sister, the Lord says, lay your offering down, go take care of the situation with your brother and sister, then pick it back up and bring it to me. That is something I really, really, with all my heart, sense that if we as the body of Christ, we as the church, if we're going to serve as one, we need to be as one. We need to love as one. We need to speak to each other like we love each other. And we need to go to one another from this section to this section to these sections and intermix with each other and say it's good to be in the house of the Lord. And I think so many times we get caught up with let's come, let's go, let's come, let's come, let's worship, let's do our thing. And we forget one another. I look sometimes when we... Uh, you know, this church thing might not be your thing because you're thinking, well, I, I don't want any more drama. I have enough drama in my own life, my home, my work. I don't want any more. Um, I, I don't want to get around people that I might not be getting along with. And, and you've got to think about this. When we ask and when God moves us to serve one another and the church, we've got to lay these issues aside. And sometimes when we, when we look at serving the church and helping others, it compounds sometimes some, some, some problems, creates some problems. First problem I, I wrote down here is, is competition. Competition. And I, and I look at this that when you see un, unknowingly or knowingly, sometimes we play a classic game of one-up. That there's sometimes a member in the church that does something great for the community and does something wonderful that they go out be the hands and feet of Christ and God works in their lives then there's another member member two that that comes and goes out, you know out to another country and does mission work for quite some time and one thing that you see is maybe sometimes the pastor will have one member come up on stage and be recognized for what is going on and what they've done and what they've accomplished but member number one never got the publicity that member number two got. Sometimes we play that one-up game, competition sometimes, and sometimes these serving and these movings, we, we miss out the true issue of the church is it's not about competition, about Jesus. It's about Jesus and only Jesus, and no matter who gets vi visual or who gets the cause or the clap or the standing ovation, it's Jesus that we're doing the mission for. Amen. Number two I see is, is self-service. So many times I think sometimes that we serve out of an opportunity to have a me story. That leading, giving, helping, supporting becomes an opportunity for us 
to be noticed. That sometimes when it's not much about helping as making sure people know who we helped. Let's get to the basics again. It's never about us. It's about him. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit moving through a body, through the willingness of stepping out in faith and saying, Lord, take me out of it and you move me in. It's an opportunity to minister the gospel to the lost, to our surrounding community, and to others who need it. One other issue is I see stardom. Everybody wants to play a guitar. Everybody, anybody wants to play drums, you can go ahead. I need a break. If you all want to play drums, talk to Pastor Phil and me afterwards. We will gladly, gladly give you some golden sticks. But I see everybody wants to play the guitar, be on stage, and, and, and be in the spotlight, the stardom, but nobody wants to take out trash. You know, I see so many times everybody wants to work the, the real cool lights and the new technology, but many of us have hard times wanting to change diapers or wanting to go spend two hours with the nursing home people before service. I want you guys to think about this as we move forward, that when it comes to serving and leading, we have bought into an idea that being on stage is greater than being behind the scenes. We only value sometimes the big, visible talents. But I'm here this morning to tell you, and I say this with all due respect, it's not the new pastor that we will get next month that makes the church. Now, I believe full heartedly that God has a shepherd and a person for this church that's going to lead us in a way that is powerful. It's not a program that runs the church. It's not what Think Orange might be implementing into your families or to your new thinking of blessing your student in a home setting. I'll just be honest, you should be doing that anyway. What moves a church and is the church is the people here. That when we come together, that when we move together, that when we talk to each other, when we communicate together, when we build a relationship together, we start seeing something happening and start seeing something maneuver. And it's called one. That we start thinking the same thing. We start acting the same way. We start getting passionate about the same ideas. Because what, what breaks his heart should break ours. And when we're all in accord and when we're all in unity, when we're all stretching forth and serving, it's not these things that keep a church going, but it is the church of Christ that sticks together and bonds together in unity to move forward to his kingdom. Amen. Glory to his name. I tell our youth, I tell our youth sometimes just to be silly, and and sometimes we've last couple of weeks we've had our college students with us, and you know we always say turn your cell phones off, but this is okay if you want to, but I always give them a tweetable moment, you know if anybody wants to tweet anything, and I always write, put this last time I, I share this message is when we get wrapped up in our in the significance of our service, we miss the significance of the church. That when we get wrapped up in the significance of our service, we miss the significance of our church. As I move forward and, and to hit Nehemiah, if you guys can turn your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 4, um, we're just going to hit this pretty quickly. But I love the story. I love, if you guys have not read the story of Nehemiah, I challenge you in the disciple plan that you have uh, in your bulletins this morning, you will see some questions that really challenge you uh, this week, but also... Uh, to really take time and read the story of what God has done in this life to move forward in service. But one thing, be, as we just jump, and we're going to be jumping pretty quickly from going to, to chapter 1 to chapter 4, as we get into the project of the wall being built, is, is these amazing statistics that I, I just came across in studying this, and it blew my mind to see that the passion when you see a need and you move towards a need, that they worked with the diligency for a purpose of seeing a project complete and the move of God being fulfilled. That's looking at this in chapter 4, that they were able to accomplish this setting, this goal, this wall of Jerusalem being built. They did in 52 days. In 
We're talking a city, city walls, city gates, 52 days, and it was an accomplishing uh, just something huge that none of them thought they could do, but they were all in the same purpose, the same mission, and it was an astonishing event. I could take 20 minutes alone, and I would butcher the names in chapter 3 of who all worked together for this project. But it's amazing how people came together for the cause of saying something that they wanted to move towards to, that they saw the need of saying, God, let's see our city rise again. Let's see the walls be built and they come together. But I want you guys to think about this, and this is the part I'm going to read in chapter 4, that before we picture happy families whistling tunes as they cheerfully build gates in the wall, consider this. There was an enemy who saw them at work, who saw them taking the time and trying to build something up that once was destroyed. And so you look at this. I can see it now by late afternoon. They're probably pretty worn out. And as they're worn out, there's probably some, some scheming going on and some people getting together saying, I can take that guy over there with the paintbrush. You now, you get that guy over there who's laying the concrete. Now, we can get this and we can nail these people and get them down. So in the midst of even enemy opposition, Nehemiah motivated a group to follow through, continue to keep moving forward. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, read along with me if you're there with me. It says, from that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand, held the weapon in the other, and each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. So I look at this, and this moves me. This moves me so much. Because when I see something like this, When I see men, when I see women, when I see children standing together, coming together, even in the midst of war, I will just go ahead and lay this out to us as a family and as a body, is will we fight for one another? Will we fight for one another? Do we love and do we care about so many of us in this room that no matter what, no matter what transitions take place, no matter what happens in this place, no matter what, this is our church, this is God's people, and we're working together for the cause of his sake. That when one suffers, we all suffer. Like Jewel said this morning, you know, kind of like last week, and I, I represent, I was one of those staff members. I wish that scripture kind of went the opposite way when it says one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. I pray that when one wakes, we all wake. When we all walk to the church, we all go to the church. When we all worship, we all worship together. I wish that's how that scripture read. But I see that how can Nehemiah work together with enemy? How, how can he work together with getting people side by side working and getting ready to fight at the same time? And here's the thing as we get ready to close. The people together worked. They had compassion. They saw that there was a need for a building. They saw the need that there was need of a gate. And they were negatively affected by the fact that they didn't have this anymore. That they wanted this. They wanted to move forward in this. And every one of them had compassion and they cared. And they said, what do we need to do? What can we do? How can we serve? How can we move forward in making a difference in what we are trying to establish and move forward. Second thing, they had unity. The reason why it was so built, built so quickly, it wasn't because that, that any person had any particular type of, of skill set, but that they were used for their issue, that they were used for their goal, they were used for their mindset, that Nehemiah placed and said, this is where I want you to be, this is where I want you to be, and everyone said, yes, how can I serve and how can I help? Unity for the cause. And they were gifting. One thing they loved, loved to do, was to see things happen and take place. And to see that this was a joy in their hearts and their lives as to see the city walls rise again. I look at the scripture, um, and if the band can come up, we will we'll close this way. 
I look at this scripture and I, and I, and I just see so many times um, the, the Apostle Paul that even though this was way before Nehemiah, or after Nehemiah's time, uh, how true it is today uh, in Romans chapter 12, verse 6, when you see that we all have in this place as a church different gifts. And that we see in, in Romans 12, chapter 6, and, and I'm sorry, Romans 12, verse 6, uh, we will see this. And, and if you have it there, read along with me. If not, uh, just listen to these powerful words that the Apostle Paul wrote. It says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take that responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy. But work hard to serve the Lord enthusiastically. I love those words. And I want to encourage you guys this morning to ask yourselves three questions. Because when I look at this, when I see as we are moving forward, what is an exciting moment at Heritage Fellowship? To see something that God is moving towards us, a family. As He shares the word with us each and every week when that time comes. Again, I want to encourage us it's not about a man who steps up here, it's about the church who sits out here. look at three questions. Where am I gifted? This is something I want all of us to ask ourselves. Is where do you see yourself gifted? And how can you apply that gift that God has given you into the willingness of the church? I look at the powerful moments that we see. What makes a church function? Well, what makes a church function is the church. Gary working in camera every what makes a church function is Lance Bow in the media center, which you probably never see because he's there every week doing an amazing job. Men and women sacrificing the smell of diapers. My son's in there, I can say that. He's got some good stuff. 